Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being in this place to study this very important subject about Christian standards. It's a subject that is not dealt with very frequently, but is very, very important. So we ask that you will guide us not only as we begin this series, but that you will guide us throughout the entire series. I ask, Lord, that you will bless those who are watching by live stream, that they might be blessed as well. Help us, Lord, to make the right decisions when it comes to lifestyle choices. And we thank you for the promise of your presence, and we claim that promise in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. One of my favorite national parks in the United States is Grand Teton National Park in northwestern Wyoming. In fact, I might say that it's my favorite national park. There's a certain lake there that I enjoy going to early in the morning. When there's no wind, everything is absolutely calm. There's a beautiful snow-capped mountain in the background with beautiful pine trees. And I look in the lake, and there is a perfect reflection of the background in the lake. I've taken pictures there. And you cannot tell which is the original and what is the reflection, because the reflection is so clear. Now, I remember the first time that I went there, the lake was just crystal clear. It was just absolutely calm. I took a pebble and I threw it into the lake. And the lake, you know, when you throw a pebble into a lake, you have ripples. First of all, you have a small ripple from the place where the stone fell. Then that ripple becomes a larger ripple. That ripple becomes a larger ripple. That one in turn becomes larger, and then the largest one on the outside. The interesting thing is that all of the ripples derive from an original ripple. And the ripples outside are actually an enlargement and an extension of the original ripple. Now you say, why am I sharing this illustration with you as we begin our study this evening. Because we are going to notice that this ripple principle applies to the lifestyle choices that we make and the source particularly of those lifestyle choices. So let's begin by stating that the original ripple at the very center, at the very core, that determines what our lifestyle choices should be, is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. This is the foundational principle. This is the original ripple from which everything else flows. And these are verses that we know very well. It says there, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So basically the foundational principle of the universe is love for God. That is the original ripple, if you please. But there's a second principle or ripple that derives from this one. And it's the one that we find in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. So the original ripple is love for God. Then there's the second ripple, which we find in Leviticus 19 and verse 18. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I 
and the Lord. So extended from the original principle, love for God, we have another principle, which is love for our fellow human beings, love for our neighbor, as it's expressed here in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. And the second principle, or the second ripple, depends on the first. Just like when you throw a stone into the lake, the second ripple originates with the first. Go with me to 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, where we see the relationship between love for God and love for our fellow human beings. 1 John 4 and verse 20 reads in the following way. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So does this second ripple depend on the first? Sure. If you love God, if you truly love God, you are going to what? You are going to love your neighbor. By extension, if you please. Now Jesus affirmed both of these principles. Go with me to Matthew chapter 22, in verses 34 to 39. Matthew 22, 34 to 39. A young theologian comes to Jesus, and this theologian asked Jesus a question, a very important question. Of course, this young theologian wanted to put Jesus between a rock and a hard place. But Jesus, of course, uh, answered correctly and taught this young man a very important lesson. It says there in Matthew 22, verse 34, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, when it says a lawyer, it's talking about an expert in the law of Moses. In other words, this is not a secular lawyer. It's not an attorney. It's a theologian. And so it says in verse 35, Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? In other words, what is the original ripple, to use our illustration? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus repeated the two principles that we read from the Old Testament. Love for God, the original ripple, the foundational ripple, where everything else comes from, then another ripple, which is love for our neighbor. But of course the question comes up. What does it mean to love God? What does it mean to love our neighbor? How do we know that we love God and that we love our neighbor? How is love for God and our neighbor manifested? You know, loving God, according to Deuteronomy 6, does not define it. And Leviticus 19, verse 18, does not define what love is. It simply says, love God and love your neighbor. So we need another ripple, where the original ripple, loving God, and the second ripple, loving your neighbor, is extended into a third ripple, which enlarges upon the first two. And what is the third ripple? Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Deuteronomy 4, 12 and 13. This describes the Ten Commandments. It says there, in verse 12, And the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire, you heard the sound of his words, but saw no form. You only heard a voice. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tables of stone. Now, could God have written the Ten Commandments on one table if he had wanted to? 
Could he, if he had wanted to? Sure. Could he have written the commandments on three tables of stone, if he had wanted to? Yes. So the question is, why did God write the Ten Commandments on two tables of stone? For the simple reason that the Ten Commandments present an amplification of the original two principles of love for God and love for our neighbor. In other words, the Ten Commandments broaden and amplify what it means to love God and what it means to love your neighbor. The first four commandments amplify what it means to love God. If you love God, you are not going to have other gods. If you love God, you're not going to make an image of God that degrades your concept of God. If you love God, you're, you're going to respect his name. If you love God, you're going to spend the Sabbath with him in fellowship. So the first table of the law amplifies what it means to love God. The last six commandments broaden what it means to love your neighbor. It further defines what it means to love your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, your parents, by the way, would be included as your neighbor, you are going to respect your parents. You're going to honor your father and your mother. If you love your neighbors, you're not going to kill them. You're going to do everything to preserve their life. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to commit adultery with his wife or with her husband. If you love your neighbor, you're going to respect your neighbor's property. You're not going to steal what belongs to your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to gossip and bear false witness against your neighbor. And if you love your neighbor, you are not going to covet that which belongs to your neighbor. So you see, the Ten Commandments are a commentary and amplification of what it means to love God and love your fellow human beings. So up till now we have three ripples. What is the first ripple? Love for God. That is amplified where? Loving your neighbor. If you don't love your neighbor who you can see, how can you say that you love God whom you cannot see? What is the third ripple, if you please? The third ripple is the Ten Commandments. They, the Ten Commandments broaden what it means to love God and what it means to love your fellow human beings. But there is a fourth ripple. You say, really? A fourth ripple? Yes. That fourth ripple is in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 40. And what I want to do is begin reading once again at verse 34 uh, so that we can catch the context. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And now let's read verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what is the fourth ripple? The fourth ripple is the Bible. You say, well, it says the law and the prophets. Yes, because there was no New Testament when Jesus spoke these words. But would we include the New Testament as a broadening of the original principles of love for God and love for your fellow human beings? Absolutely, you would have to include the Bible. And so Jesus says, listen, on these two commandments, love for God and love for your fellow human beings, hang all the law and the prophets. Now, let's take an example. The commandment that says, you shall not commit adultery. Does that commandment define what adultery is? Does it? No. Does it tell us the baleful consequences of adultery? Does it tell us what the sentence is for people who commit adultery? No. But you have stories in the Bible that answer those questions. You remember the story of David? Does the story of David define clearly what adultery is? 
Oh, you better believe it. Puts flesh and bones on the commandment. You shall not commit adultery. Does the story of David also show us the terrible consequences of adultery? Absolutely. It led to the death of Uriah the Hittite. Does it also tell us, the story of David, what is the result, what David deserved as a result of committing adultery? Yes. David, unless he had repented, would have what? Who had suffered death? Because the penalty for adultery was death by stoning. So you see, the story of David's adultery helps us understand the commandment that says, you shall not commit adultery. We could say that the entire Bible is a commentary of the Ten Commandments. I challenge you to check that out. The entire Bible is an illustration, an amplification of the Ten Commandments. But there is one last ripple. That last ripple is the writings of the spirit of prophecy. That is a further amplification, an explanation, and clarification of the biblical principles. Let's read Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. This is speaking about God's end time church. It is a verse that comes after several events in that chapter. You have first of all the dragon wanting to kill the man-child, and then the man-child who is Jesus escapes from him, and he ascends to God and to his throne. Then the woman has to flee to the wilderness for 1260 years, that's 538 to 1798. And then it says the earth helps the woman, that's the territory of the United States. And then after that you have this verse about the final remnant church. It says in Revelation 12, verse 17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring, or as the King James says, the remnant of her seed, who keep the commandments of God. So they keep the Ten Commandments, but they have something else. What do they have? And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Well, we need to go to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, tells us what is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here, an angel appears to John. And John, seeing this majestic, glorious being, feels the impulse of bowing before him and worshiping him. But I want you to notice that the angel tells him, don't you do that. Let's pick up there at verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. However, he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So what is it that the final remnant church is going to have? It is going to have the spirit of prophecy. And the spirit of prophecy further amplifies what is in the Ten Commandments and what is found in Scripture. Let me ask you, the fifth ripple in the lake, is that fifth ripple a result of the first ripple? Is that an enlargement of the first ripple? Yes. It's not something separate, something different. It's an enlargement of the original ripple. The spirit of prophecy is not an addition or something separate from the Bible. It simply is an amplification or an enlargement of what we already find in principle in Scripture. Let me read you Ellen White's testimony about the role of her writings. I'm reading now from volume 5 of the testimonies, page 663 and 664. She is so explicit in this passage about what her role is, what the role of the spirit of prophecy is. It's the the largest ripple, the greatest amplification of love for God, love for your neighbor, the Ten Commandments, uh, the Bible, the spirit of prophecy. Notice what Ellen White wrote. 
She's talking about a brother, Jay. You know, they don't put the name on these testimonies that she wrote to individuals. She says, Brother Jay would confuse the mind by seeking to make it appear that the light that God has given through the testimonies is an addition to the Word of God. But in this, he presents the matter in a false light. So this Brother Jay was saying, well, the writings of Ellen White, that's an addition to the writings uh, of the Bible. You know, it's added to the Bible, separate from the Bible. She continues writing, God has seen fit in this manner to bring the minds of his people to his word. Where do the writings of Ellen White take us to? To his word. To give them a clearer understanding of it. What is the purpose of the spirit of prophecy? To give people a clearer what? Understanding. understanding of the word. She continues writing. The word of God is sufficient. What does sufficient mean? Enough. The word of God is sufficient to enlighten the most beclouded mind and may be understood by those who have any desire to understand it. However, notwithstanding all this, some who profess to make the Word of God their study are found living in direct opposition to its plainest teachings. Then, to leave men and women without excuse, God gives plain and pointed testimonies, bringing them back to the Word that they have neglected to follow. Notice once again she's saying it brings us back where? Just like the, the last ripple brings us back to the ripples before, she says, back to the word that they have neglected to follow. Then she says this, the word of God abounds in general principles for the formation of correct habits of living. And the testimonies, general and personal, have been calculated to call their attention more especially to these principles. So in other words, the writings of Ellen White have the purpose of directing our minds to the principles that we find in the Bible. So this evening we are going to talk about the role of the spirit of prophecy and how it relates to the principles that we find in the Bible. Are her writings, in addition to the Bible, separate from the Bible? No. By her own testimony, the purpose is to explain principles that are already contained in Scripture, to amplify, and she says in another place, to correct those who err from Bible truth. Now, some have been critical, for example, of the book Messages to Young People. They say that this book is unduly legalistic and restrictive. Some have even said that it is anti-biblical. Why? Because in this book, Ellen White seriously frowns on gambling, competitive sports, dancing, novel reading, going to the movies, she called it a theater in her day, the use of tobacco and alcohol, even in moderation, playing cards, immodest dress, gaudy adornment, music which appeals to the baser elements of human nature. And so because she addresses all of these things, people say, oh, she, she was just a Puritan from a different age. But what she wrote was for back then. It's not for us now. We live in the 21st century. That was okay back then, but not now. Many believe that what Ellen White wrote in Messages to Young People is an addition of her opinions to the Bible. After all, where do you find in the Bible statements such as these? Thou shalt not gamble. Thou shalt not go to the movies. Thou shalt not smoke. Thou shalt not play poker. Thou shalt not dance. Thou shalt not drink wine with your meals. Thou shalt not watch soap operas. Thou shalt not wear clothes that entice the opposite sex. Thou shalt not have premarital sex. Thou shalt not listen to rock music. 
Can you give me a, a chapter and verse where you find those prohibitions? You can't. So people say, what Ellen White says contradicts the Bible. Because none of those things the Bible addresses. Is Ellen White really adding anything to the Bible when she discourages these things? Is the Seventh-day Adventist church really unduly restrictive? Why all these standards, people ask, that the Adventist church have? Maybe perhaps we've missed the main point, and that is that all of these standards are merely enlargements of biblical principles, an amplification of the original ripple, if you please. Should we perhaps then look why she says these things? For the biblical principles that stand behind these counsels that she gives. Should we not look for the principle of what she says, in other words? Now I'm going to give you a few examples of things that she wrote that some, even in the Seventh-day Adventist church, have been critical of. I want to read you a statement that we find in Councils to the Church, page 263. Here Ellen White is talking about guarding the edges of the Sabbath. Now the Bible says that we're supposed to keep the Sabbath from sundown to sundown. She says we're supposed to guard the edges of the Sabbath. Let me read the statement. We should jealously guard the edges of the Sabbath. Remember that every moment is consecrated holy time. Whenever it is possible, employers should give their workers the hours from Friday noon until the beginning of the Sabbath. Give them time for preparation, that they may welcome the Lord's day with quietness of mind. By such a course, you will suffer no loss, even in temporal things. Now when you read Nehemiah chapter 13, you'll find that Nehemiah commanded the doors of Jerusalem to be closed when it began to be dark at the gate, before the Sabbath began. So you have an example of this in the Bible. Now the question is, why would Ellen White say we're supposed to guard the edges of the Sabbath? Let me give you an illustration. I um, went to school in our university, it's actually a K-12 through N university in Medellin, Colombia. Um, you know, back in the days when I went to school there, um, there was strict segregation of boys and girls, boys on one side of the auditorium and girls on the other. And uh, there was one side of the campus for the girls and one side of the campus for the boys. And woe to the boys if they put one step into the girl's side and vice versa. But those who formalized a relationship with their boyfriend or girlfriend, they had a special privilege with authorization from the parents. And that is that they, every two weeks, could go to a teacher's house, and behind a curtain, they could sit and they could talk together for two whole hours. Wow. I'll tell you what, I, I enjoyed both sides of the equation. I did it as a student, and then I had students come when I was a teacher there, many years later. So I know both perspectives. Now let me ask you, do you think I arrived at the teacher's house right at the moment when we were supposed to start? Are you kidding? No. I always arrive 10 or 15 minutes early. How about my wife? She also arrived 10 or 15 minutes early. Why? Well, because we wanted to seal, see if we could steal a little extra time. So that's guarding the edges. Are you with me? If we love Jesus, we're going to be ready. To, to keep the Sabbath with Jesus, to spend the time with Jesus. And when the Sabbath is coming to an end, we're not looking at the church bulletin and saying, now let's see, what time is sundown tonight so I can go pop my popcorn? No. We'll be sorry that the Sabbath is ending. We, we'll want to extend the Sabbath a little bit. Does that make sense? Of course it does. It's not going contrary to Scripture. 
Now let's talk about gambling. You won't find a Bible verse that says don't gamble. Do you have principles that stand behind that? Does gambling make you covetous? Oh yes it does. Are you a winner at someone else's expense? That's certainly loving your neighbor, isn't it? Is it the result of your work? The Bible says that you're supposed to make a living by your work. Six days you shall labor. That's a violation of that principle. Does gambling instill and stimulate greed? You know that it does. Does it develop an addiction? Yes, it does. Could you use your money to help people in the Lord's work? Yes. So there's a whole host of principles behind the issue of not gambling. Let's talk about smoking. Ellen White says that, that tobacco is a deadly poison and that smoking is a sin. Say, now wait a minute. There's not one of the Ten Commandments that says thou shalt not smoke. True enough. But you do have a commandment that says thou shalt not kill. And by the way, it does not say uh, thou shalt not kill quickly. In other words, killing isn't taking out a gun and killing somebody quickly. Thou shalt not kill would mean if you're killing yourself in a longer period by smoking, which eventually leads to emphysema, to cancer, and to other diseases. Does smoking affect my relationship with God? It most certainly does. Does it steal years from the service that I could render God very frequently? Yes. Is it an enslaving habit? Yes. Does it affect your willpower to do what is right? Absolutely. Does a secondhand hand smoke help our neighbor? No, they say secondhand smoke is worse than the person who smokes. Is spending your money on cigarettes good stewardship? No. Shouldn't that money be brought to the, brought to the church or be given to benefit people? Is it good care for the temple that belongs to God, your body temple? No. See, there's a host of principles behind the idea you shall not smoke. But some Adventists will say, the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not smoke, so I can smoke. Because they're used to thinking only in terms of the specifics that Ellen White mentions, instead of thinking about the principles that stand behind the specifics. Love for God and love for, love for your fellow human beings. Let's talk about a controversial subject, subject, dress. I'm not talking about people who dress modestly. I'm talking about dress for the purpose of display. Does dress sometimes suggest impure thoughts? You might not want to admit it, but it does. Does it lead primarily the men to covet? Let's be honest. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks upon a woman to covet her has already committed adultery in his heart. And uh, you know, there are some some women who say, well, that's his problem, not mine. God is going to hold us accountable for leading other people into sin. It doesn't excuse their sin, but there's guilt to go around on both sides. Let me ask you, does God address, attack, attract attention to Jesus or does it attract attention to us? It attracts attention to us. What about an investment of our money in gaudy dress and jewelry and things like that? Does that have anything to say about love for God and love for our fellow human beings? Should not our money be brought to the Lord's cause? Should it not be used to benefit our fellow human beings? So does dress have very serious implications? It does. Even though the Bible does not give us specifics 
the Bible in principle tells us that dress should not be gaudy, it should not attract attention to ourselves, it should not lead to impure thoughts, it should not lead us to spend our means unnecessarily when those means could be used to benefit those who are in need. Let me read you a passage from Ellen White. Very interesting passage. I want you to notice the principles that she refers to when she talks about dress. This is the much maligned messages to young people, page 351 and 352. The Bible teaches modesty in dress. Does the Bible teach that? It teaches it in principle, right? She continues. She gives a Bible verse now, 1 Timothy 2.9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, 1 Timothy 2.9. This forbids, see she's taking that verse and she's going to apply the principle now. This forbids display in dress, gaudy colors, profuse ornamentation. Any device designed to attract attention to the wearer or to excite admiration is excluded from the modest apparel that God's word enjoins. Does dress sometimes tell us, uh, does it announce selfishness? You most, most certainly does. She continues, our dress is to be inexpensive. See, there's the principle. Not with gold or pearls or costly array. Money, now notice the principle, money is a trust from God. It is not ours to expend for the gratification of pride or ambition. In the hands of God's children, it is food for the hungry and clothing for the naked. Are you seeing the principle? It's to benefit whom? It's to benefit our fellow human beings. She continues, It is a defense to the oppressed, a means of health to the sick, or preaching the gospel to the poor. You could bring happiness to many hearts by using wisely the money that is now spent for show. Consider the life of Christ. Study his character. And be partakers with him in his self-denial. In the professed Christian world, Enough is expended for jewels and needlessly expensive dress to feed all the hungry and to clothe all the naked. <laughs> Just imagine all the money that is spent on jewelry that could be used to alleviate the needs of our fellow human beings. Here, there's, there's one of the original ripples. Then she concludes by writing, fashion and display absorb the means that might comfort the poor and the suffering. They rob the world of the gospel of the Savior's love. Did you see how she's taking the principles and applying them to the issue of dress? She is not adding to the Bible anything of substance. She's just detailing, she's amplifying, she's explaining the principles that we find in Scripture, and she actually quotes a verse where it says that in like manner women adorn themselves in modest apparel. That's the principle. So we take the principle and we apply it through prayer, through God's wisdom, to the decisions that we make in our practical life. Are you catching the picture? Now let's talk about social drinking. You say, well, how come you're mentioning this? That's not an Adventist problem. Just come out to California. <laughs> or down to California. It's a, it's a growing problem among Adventists. And many try to justify drinking wine, for example. It's been proven that any amount of alcohol kills brain cells, even in small amounts. And people say, yeah, but it lowers cholesterol. And it's an antioxidant. But what the industry doesn't tell you is that grape juice will lower your cholesterol and it is also an antioxidant. You don't need the fermentation. But the industry says, hey, you know, wine 
fermented wine is good for you because it lowers your cholesterol and is an antioxidant. But what they don't tell you is that pure Welch's grape juice is going to do the same without all of the collateral damage. So let's look for some biblical principles when it comes to drinking that which kills brain cells. Does drinking improve my ability to communicate with God? Does it lead to clear thinking? Stronger willpower? Clearer choices? Does it save the lives of people when an individual is driving under the influence? Does it destroy the body temple that belongs to God? It most certainly does. There are many stories in the Bible that show the negative effects of alcohol. You know, Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker. You know the text, right? We know the story of Nadab and Abihu. They were under the influence. And if you read there in Leviticus chapter 10, it tells us that because they drank wine, they were not able to distinguish between the holy and the common. Last weekend I preached a sermon at 3 ABN camp meeting on the wine of Babylon. Of course, the wine in Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 14 uh, and chapter 18 is talking about spiritual wine, false doctrine. But literal wine does the same thing to you as false doctrine. It confuses the mind. It doesn't, it, it doesn't allow you to make right choices. It doesn't help you to be able to distinguish between the holy and the common. And then you have the story of Belshazzar's banquet. You know, the story of Nadab and Abihu shows what wine does. It keeps you from distinguishing the holy from the common. It leads you to present the holy, the common, as if it were holy. But the story of Belshazzar has the opposite teaching, and that is Belshazzar used the holy vessels and treated them as if it were common. Let me ask you, does the Christian world take a holy day and make it a common day? Do they take a common day and make it holy? Yeah, because they have the influence of what? Of wine. Spiritual wine. But physical wine confuses just as much. The Apostle Paul gave the principle and he says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Which you have from God and it's not your own? And then it says, that God will destroy those who destroy the body temple. There's the principle. Anything that lessens physical strength, mental vigor, makes us less capable of rejecting evil and choosing the good and distinguishing between right and wrong. So are there clear principles in Scripture when it comes to this issue? Absolutely. Ellen White is simply amplifying what we find already in Scripture. Now let's talk about another uh, thing that Ellen White mentions in Messages to Young People, the issue of music. Controversial issue in the church, the issue of music. You know, the argument is used, well, I like it. It makes me feel good. I can't see anything wrong with it. And you know, when I hear uh, young people say, I can't see anything wrong with it, I say, I'm going to pray that the Lord will fix your eyes. Because if you can't see anything wrong with it, you need to have spiritual discernment. Are there definite principles of what constitutes good and bad music, right and wrong music? Absolutely. Musicologists, experts in music, will tell you that there are definite principles when it comes to melody, harmony, rhythm, etc., on what constitutes good music and what constitutes basically noise. You know, before we choose music, we need to ask, is this violating biblical principles? Does it bring me closer to Jesus? Very important questions. Ellen White once wrote, in Adventist Home, page 407, about the impact that music has 
on young people. And this is talking about the kind of music that so many young people, even young people in our church, are listening to these days. Rock music and, and all of these other genres of music. She wrote, I feel alarmed as I witness everywhere the frivolity of young men and young women who profess to believe the truth. Is that talking about Adventists? Adventist youth? Yeah, they profess to believe the truth. She continues, God does not seem to be in their thoughts. Their minds are filled with nonsense. Their conversation is only empty, vain talk. They have a keen ear for music, and Satan knows what organs to excite, to animate, engross, and charm the mind so that Christ is not desired. You know, there's this argument. You know, the important thing about music is simply the lyrics. You know, if the lyrics, if the words are Christian, it's okay. The music is neutral. The music makes no difference. Ellen White makes the difference. Because here she says, they have a keen ear for music, and Satan knows what organs to excite. She's talking about the music. She's not talking about the lyrics. And probably many of you are acquainted with Ellen White's testimony concerning the Indiana camp meeting in the year 1900. You know, there was this music that was being used at a Seventh-day Adventist camp meeting in Indiana. I did a two-hour presentation on this that we have on DVD, studying the historical circumstances, etc. And basically, she spoke of there being a bedlam of noise, shouting, and dancing. And she condemned the music. She said, she didn't say, you know, the words, because really the words that, were, that they were singing were the words of many of the traditional hymns. But the way in which they used the instruments led to shouting and dancing and the raising of hands, just a, a regular bedlam of noise is what Ellen White refers to. And then she wrote that, that these things which happened in Indiana would take place again just before the close of probation. And I believe that we are seeing those things these days, even within the church. What about going to the theater, to the movie theater? In the times of Ellen White, it was live theater. There was no television. There were no movies in the movie theater. But, you know, it was really live actors. That's a no-brainer, what Ellen White had to say about the theater. Let me ask you, let's apply the principle to television, because today, you know, it's television, it's going to the movies, which did not exist back then, because they had live actors, you know, now the actors are on the screen. Do these movies bring us closer to Jesus? What do they emphasize? They emphasize killing, lying, cheating, adultery, covetousness, spiritualism, ostentation, and you know that I'm telling you the truth. That's what these movies emphasize. Do these movies give me a desire for spiritual things? No. Let's be honest. Could I invite Jesus to sit right next to me to watch the movie? Could you invite Jesus to sit next to you to watch a movie where people are being blown away right and left? And where people are committing adultery and using profanity? Let's be honest. Jesus would not sit next to us to watch that. Do these things make me long for heaven? Do these things help me love others more and love God more? The answer is no. Any rational person would say no. Now what did Ellen White have to say? Before I read what she had to say, let me read the biblical principle. See, the Bible doesn't say don't go to the movie theater. Don't watch, don't watch these things on television. Don't, don't, uh, you know, don't put before your eyes the, these specific uh, Hollywood things. Well, the, the Bible doesn't mention that. But the Bible has the principle. And we need to apply the principle. We need to learn to apply 
the principles to every aspect of our daily lives, our choices of our daily lives. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, a verse that is very well known, finally brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. There's the principle. So if what, what you're looking at does not square with the principles in Philippians 4 verse 8, it's best not to watch these things. Now let me read you what Ellen White had to say in Adventist Home, page 516. Among the most dangerous resorts for pleasure is the theater. Instead of being a school for morality and virtue, as is so often claimed, it is the very hotbed of immorality. Vicious habits and sinful propensities are strengthened and confirmed by these entertainments. So the flesh is confirmed and strengthened by exposing ourselves to these things. She continues, low songs, lewd gestures, expressions and attitudes deprave the imagination and debase the morals. And she's speaking about the youth. Every youth who habitually attends such exhibitions will be corrupted in principle. Corrupted in what? In principle. There is no influence in our land more powerful to poison the imagination, to destroy religious impressions, and to blunt the relish for the tranquil pleasures and sober realities of life than theatrical amusements. The love for these scenes increases with each indulgence as the desire for intoxicating drink, drink strengthens with its use. In other words, it becomes intoxicating, habit-forming. And then she gives this counsel, the only safe course, uh, the only safe course, she wrote, writes, is to shun the theater, the circus, and every other questionable place of amusement. Now, some people talk about gray areas. Have you heard uh, people say, well, that's a gray area. We don't have any, any clear counsel on that. So, you know, if it's gray, if you do it one way or the other way, that would be okay. For example, we've talked about, you know, the basic principles being loving God and loving your neighbor. Those are the basic principles. Ten Commandments amplify that. The Bible further amplifies. The spirit of prophecy further amplifies the original principles. Now, what happens when you have areas that people call gray areas? Let me give you an illustration. Let's suppose that uh, you're living in, in a time of the Second World War, somebody's hiding in your house, and the Gestapo comes to your door and asks you point blank, is such and such a person here? What would you do? Well, you'd say the loving thing would be to lie, to save the person that you have in your house. But let me ask you, would that be the right thing to do? Is it okay to lie under circumstances in the name, under certain circumstances in the name of love? Or is there such a thing as a counterfeit love? Let me just read three texts from Scripture as we bring this to a close today. And tomorrow we're going to deal with the issue of absolute integrity and truthfulness. We're going to see whether it's okay sometimes to violate biblical principles in the name of love, to violate the Ten Commandments in the name of love. In Proverbs 14 and verse 12, very well-known verse, there is a way that seems right to man, but its end 
is the way of death. You cannot trust your heart to tell you what is right. You have to follow what God says is right in the holy book and in the spirit of prophecy. In other words, the source of decision is outside, not inside. Here's another statement. Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? What is the heart? Desperately wicked. So you, can you depend on your heart to make decisions? No. What is it that helps you make the right decisions? Oh, I feel that this is what I'm supposed to do. I think that's what I'm supposed to do. You know, that's what my mind tells me I'm supposed to do. No. We need an external guiding principle. And the external guiding principle is the Word of God and the amplification that we find in the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy. Here's another statement. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. But whoever walks wisely will be delivered. We're going to notice later on in this series where it takes several cases of individuals in the Bible to find out what was the basis of their decisions. Was it because, they, was it, because it looked right? It seemed right? It felt right? It sounded right? Or were God's guiding principles that which determined what they were supposed to do even at the risk of losing all including life. Daniel comes to mind and his three friends. We're going to talk about these who would rather die than sin. And Ellen White says that only those who are willing to die rather than sin are the only ones that will be found faithful at the end of time. 